What's going on everybody? How you doing today? My name is Jim Games and I react to videos on the internet and in today's video I will be continuing my BTS journey. Now you might be asking yourself well what's your BTS journey? Maybe you're new, who knows? Um, I'm a reactor, I react to all sorts of things on the internet and music seems to be a highlight of my channel. I do a lot of music stuff around here and I do a lot of these things called blind reactions where I basically just somebody sends me a link, I react to it and, and that's that. And they're great, they're fun, they're awesome. But I lose a lot of the context doing that. Now, for a while now, people have been wanting me to react to BTS songs. Uh, I've literally gotten hundreds, if not thousands of them in the comments. Uh, and it's been great. People have been just trying to like push me into it and say, well, hey, check this song out and that song and whatnot. And uh, I've decided not to do that. <laughs> you might be asking, well, then what am I doing here if you're not going to react to the music? Well, I want to do things in a more impactive uh, and creative way. So what I'm doing is I'm going through all these documentaries about BTS in general. Who are they as people? How did they get this big? What sort of you know, issues have they had along the way? Uh, and I'm learning about all this stuff to give me a better understanding, grasp, and just depth to the group before I even start hearing the music. Uh, hopefully this is interesting for you guys. It's interesting for me because I'm starting to learn that I also need to learn a lot more about just Korean culture in general because I feel like there's a big chunk of information that I'm missing. Uh, so be on the lookout for that kind of content as well. I gotta understand just the Koreans better. I guess, because there's just a lot of things culturally that I'm just not understanding, too. Uh, but in today's video, it's BTS versus K-pop, a video essay. Uh, this one came on my community page. Someone said you should check this video out, so I decided to put it in the playlist. Uh, it's about 30 minutes, so sit back, relax, buckle up. It's going to be a good one. Let's switch screens. Let's get right on into it. Oh, hey, before I get started, uh, please consider liking and subscribing. If you'd like to be here for my BTS journey, be here as I'm experiencing every different layer and depth of this band before I get to the music. I feel like it's going to be an interesting ride. Uh, so please consider liking and subscribing. And also a couple of really important links down below you got to check out. One is our community Discord. A uh, great group of people over there. It's the best way to keep in touch with me and to figure out what's going on with this channel. Check out the Discord. And I have a uh, Twitch link down there as well. You're going to want to check that out if you want to be part of a live reaction show. They're a ton of fun. I do them every Wednesday and Twitch and periodically throughout the week. But let's uh, get right to the video here. BTS versus K-pop, a video essay uh, by Baigang. I think it's how you say his name. I don't know. I'm going to talk about BTS again. It's time it's for a video essay. BTS versus K-pop. So BTS are really big. They're really big. They're big beyond the imagined constraints that groups like theirs are meant to reach. They've shattered numerous records for South Korean artists, including easily breaking the record for highest selling South Korean album with a seven track EP that came out less than a year ago called Map of the Soul Persona. Keep According hearing to about the Hollywood that. Reporter, they account for almost $5 billion of the South Korean economy, rivaling the value of that of Samsung and Hyundai. Those are multinational, multi-billion dollar corporations being rivaled by a six-year-old music group from an indie entertainment company. And How crazy is just that? Just think about those numbers. Think about Hyundai, think about Samsung. We probably got some variation of that project or the, those, those products in all of our homes, whether it's a TV or a car outside. Like, they're world-renowned brands. BTS is just right up there, even with them, and they've only been doing this for six years. Uh, side note here, this Map of the Soul album, people keep talking about it. I cannot wait to check it out. In response, the rest of the world is confused as f Their fans, yeah. <laughs> I swear to you, it's like the Beatles have, like, Lazarus just risen from the dead. Like, they are, people are Map of the really Soul, which has already had three million pre-orders. We have some very big fans right outside the studio American today. This is <laughs> like millions of, like, let's make them win. There are like a million retweets and everything. It makes me, me and Shawn Mendes are like, how do we get this type of fan? K-pop is a genre of music, and in order to be a K-pop artist, you got to go through K-pop college, and that's actually a real thing. It's understandable that people would be confused. How could a music group whose primary language is Korean dominate international markets to the point of being the best-selling record globally in 2019 with one EP? that had one single. In order to understand, at least well enough, how BTS became this big, you'd have to have an understanding of South Korean history, the South Korean music industry, international hip hop, and social media fandom at the least. And most publications either aren't able to gain these understandings or don't care to. So instead, most of the conversation focuses on one ostensibly understandable part of BTS's identity, K-pop. I mean, after all, BTS are a K-pop group. Right? Maybe? 
I think. You can't gain a true understanding about BTS's rise to success without understanding the world they came from, which is K-pop. The problem is, most people don't understand K-pop or BTS as much as they think they do. What do you <laughs> think when you think of K-pop, casual audience member? I'd guess you think of screaming teenage girls, perfect looks and choreography, simple English hooks, and of course that spooky underbelly that every magazine and their mama has lined up to cover over the years. There. That's uh, That was pretty much my understanding about a month ago. Uh, when I finally got around to deciding, hey, I should probably just check out what this K-pop thing is, even if it's not my cup of tea, uh, it is a phenomenon that has it <laughs> engulfed the world. Like, it's everywhere. It's massive. We're seeing the numbers right here on screen. Uh, but like I said before, like, I just don't know too much about Korean culture, uh, about these shows that they're always on, uh, social media I'm not a big fan of. Uh, so I feel like I'm missing out on a giant chunk as to why this is very popular. But hopefully they kind of discuss that in this video today. It comes highly recommended. Uh, but that, that was me. That's me. I, that, that's exactly who I am. I'm just an average, everyday uh, American guy uh, who just thought a month ago that K-pop music was literally just for little girls, uh, like screaming teenage girls. And it was just like attractive, like, like teenage boys, and they were just like placating to the girl scene. Man, was I wrong. <laughs> Man, was I wrong. There are two problems with this. One, BTS have succeeded in great part due to their divergence from these common K-pop qualities. But when BTS and their success are constantly grouped in with K-pop by Western media, the people being introduced to them who only know those things are going to think that BTS success comes down to those things, which could be further from the truth, but still isn't really true. And two, K-pop is a lot more complicated than the ideas everyone has of it. Even the people that study and discuss Korean music disagree on their definitions of what K-pop is and what the term K-pop even means. Oh, I've geez. been tangentially in the media industry for less than two years and covering BTS for less than a year, less than half a year. And uh, I'm here to tell you that the media industry is not covering BTS as well as they should in the West. Okay. I started a Twitter account with the goal of explaining these topics in a form that blends journalism and social media. It's a Twitter account called TY But Disagree. Today we're launching the first episode of our TY But Disagree video series hosted right here on Baby Gang, my YouTube channel and fake media oh, it's company. Baby Gang. If any of this is confusing, it doesn't matter. Here's what matters. Today we're going to talk about BTS in relation to K-pop. We're going to learn about what K-pop is, what BTS are, and whether or not BTS are even a K-pop group in the first place. Interesting. And before you close this video and dismiss that question as absurd, I assure you, this stuff is way more nuanced than you think it is. Part 1. What is K-pop? Alright. Is K-pop a genre or an industry? Yes. Or no. A 2017 article by TK Park on his popular blog, Ask a Korean, entitled K-Pop is not a genre, asserts that the term loosely only refers to popular music of Korea, which of course includes many types of genres and labels. Park mentions the rock group FT Island and the solo crooner IU. These two artists make different styles of music but can both be classified as K-Pop. Therefore, K-Pop can't be a genre, but more of a generalized classification. Simple enough, right? Well, no. It's important to remember that genre classification in general does not strictly refer to musical stylings. At least, this is the assertion held in a response article by Lizzie Parker at the blog Beyond Hall You from the same year, entitled, Is K-Pop a Genre? Yes. Yes, it is. That's the title. I didn't exaggerate that. Parker does not entirely throw out Park's valid assertion that K-pop is a loose classification, meaning popular music of Korea, but contends that this makes leash. it a genre all the same, as all genre classifications have this same looseness. Quote, no one actually uses genres to make concrete, definitive lists of specific kinds of music. They're relational terms we use so we can form an understanding of a piece of music, often before we have listened to it, in relation to our existing cultural reference points, and further understand our and others' enjoyment, or lack thereof. As an example, the pop genre is the messiest classification you can imagine. Louis Capaldi and Lizzo both have two of the top songs on pop charts right now, as of my making this video, but one of them makes sad white boy folk pop, and another one of them makes uh, funk, soul, and disco adjacent rap music. They're both pop artists in that they employ accessible music qualities. They have catchy melodies, they've got accessible time signatures, conventional mixes, but from a technical standpoint and from a cultural standpoint, they couldn't be any more different from each other. Both authors.
Uh, I won't even touch on what he just said there. Uh, side note, Lizzo is awesome. She's rocking the flute. Big fan. Others make valid points. Given that K-pop basically means Korean pop, that means that this Do not agree. sloppy genre classification still qualifies in a way. The only difference is the subcategorization of this music being primarily or entirely created and marketed by the Korean music industry, mostly in the Korean language and mostly performed by Koreans or people of Korean descent. In the United States, genre classification has strong ties to racial and cultural barriers. As described by the musicologist Robert Fink in a PS mag piece by Jack Denton, quote, the way genre genre works is to create categories that are partly musical but also have a lot to do with the perceived identity of the artists and the target market. This could partially explain why K-pop is such a prevalent term in the United States but is by many accounts used far less in Korea. Instead, oh, the term really? idol music is used to describe what Americans typically deem K-pop, as in the groups and solo acts who create hybridized Korean songs with western pop music qualities and usually present with precise choreography and makeup. Now that we've deconstructed the term K-pop okay. a little bit, let's talk about what idol music is and where it came from. In order to do that, a brief history of music in South Korea. All right. Let's go. For centuries up until the late 1800s, Korean culture was shaped by Sinocentrist ideals, deeply influenced by their proximity and allyship with China. This led to the preeminence of Korean Confucianism, which entailed the emphasis on things like a stringent shared moral code in social situations, a respect for elders, and a necessitation of ritualism. Those rituals extend to the traditional music styles of Korea, works which followed a pentatonic music scale, involved Chinese-derived instruments and garb, and included genres like pansori, which is a type of storytelling via vibrato-heavy, open-throated, pentatonic scale singing. These styles of music involved very conservative performances. The body is still, the clothes are unrevealing of any flesh. The lyrics were even oriented towards Confucian ideals of family and morality. Japanese rule over Korea led greatly to the introduction of Western styles of music, particularly classical styles and even balladic styles that translate more directly into modern pop music. Then after World War II, Japanese rule over Korea ended and Western artistic influences came from the United States more than anything, especially through the brief and turbulent period of American occupation. Things ebbed and flowed and changed over the decades. South Korean audiences became more and more appreciative of Western sounds, particularly as the television and the karaoke machine grew to become highly popular and as the economy improved. Hip-hop became a phenomenon in the West during the 80s, and its influence disseminated throughout the world. Sotegi and Boys debuted in 1990 and completely abandoned pentatonic scale structure, making full use of diatonic hip-hop, rock, and pop sounds. They also incorporated dancing, which had been utilized successfully by artists like Sobang Cha before them. They weren't the first to do these things they did, but they were the most influential, particularly in how they synthesized these elements, how they reformed the conventional music TV formats and other music formats, how they built a really strong fan base of young people, and their overall explosive entry into the Korean music industry signaled a change in things to come. So Teji and Boys, by the way, were pretty badass. They wrote their own stuff and they played their own instruments. And despite their music not carrying the same leftist ideals necessarily that previous attempts at Western music had in South Korea, they were still unafraid to challenge status quo and older generations in a very un-Confucian way. Notably, in 1988, South Korea lifted travel restrictions on its citizens. After Soteji, westernization in Korean pop music accelerated quickly, with the rise of groups like H.O.T., who are considered the first idol group as they were the first to be scouted, trained, and put together to become a hit boy band, as well as the rise of Korean dramas like the big 2002 hit Winter Sonata, a sudden drastic and ongoing increase of intrigue in South Korean culture and art began globally. This phenomenon is referred to as Hallyu. As a side note, I recommend that those interested in Hallyu read Kim buk Past, Present, and Future of Hallyu paper, as well as John Lee's What is the K and K-pop, which greatly informed this history section of the essay that I'm doing. Uh, in the former, Kim's states the following of Hallyu and its focus of decentralizing Western culture by adapting it. Quote, Under the current circumstances, the Hallyu boom is emerging in the modernized slash industrialized East Asia where people with an economic power have a strong desire to be the cognitive subjects of their cultural activities. In this context, Hallyu can no longer be considered a simple cultural acculturation but a transcultural phenomenon or a process of cultural power reorganization through the complex slash dynamic movements of people, mass medias, and transnational capitals.
Thanks to this eventual embrace and aim for perfection in the realm of popular Western forms, South Korea's economy is boosted drastically year by year by its cultural exports. Understanding Korean history teaches us a few things. One, that Korean culture is divided between past and present, between Western ideals and the remnants of Confucianist, Sinocentric ideals. While South Korean society still retains these moral codes and customs related to respect and ritualism, it's also being pulled quickly in the direction of more liberal, rebellious, anti-traditional ideas, in part because these ideas are fueling boosts to the country's economy. This conflict manifests in the music itself and the music industry, which is very dead set on upholding certain traditions and approaches while using art forms like hip-hop that are built on anti-establishment, anti-ritual values. This creates a tension within the music that is ironically, uniquely Korean, despite the fact that your average K-pop song bears little resemblance to anything that existed in Korea before the 20th century. Thusly, it teaches us that K-pop is more than just a genre or an industry. It is a cultural export and, somewhat antagonistic to the people who make money from K-pop, a progressive cultural movement, in a way. Additionally, so that, that's the thing to like to take away from all this. And, and what I think what the main point is is like, no, K-pop is this is an export. This is a massive export uh, that is pulling numbers that are similar to what you might see from Samsung or Hyundai or these other major companies. That that's that's kind of crazy to me. It's absolutely kind of crazy to me that, that like the economy is almost like this focused around it. And I guess that makes more sense now in context or in hindsight rather. Um, hearing about like you know how much you know the music charts matter over there and about how everything is giving kind of like a, an assigned numeric value uh, to how well it's doing at any given time. Like it just seems like everything is just very um, everything has a number. You know everything has a scale to it. Uh, everything is measured. And um, and I guess for sure they would measure every you know aspect of every song and everything of these artists because there's such a major export to them. They it's basically it's literally just a business uh, to a lot of these people, uh, to a lot of these uh, even uh, label owners and whatnot. It's it's all it is. Look at you, YG. Let's continue. Finally, K-pop is not just a genre or an industry specifically, but a format where music of various genres comes with a dance slash visuals package. So yes, yeah. K-pop is a genre in a way because it speaks to a direct social cultural concept that relates to what we understand basically is Hallyu and the underpinnings of South Korean society shifting as it balances the traditional with the progressive, the old and the new, both of which can be debated as potentially more expedient than expressive. What's funny and unsurprising is that the artists that seem to shirk conventionality and tradition the most against the grain of what makes up most of this genre that's supposed to be export friendly are the ones that become the most successful and the most exported. That can be said of Soteji, and it can be said of Sai, who very much did not look or sound like the hotties you'd see in H.O.T., but still absolutely shattered the international music market with 2012's Gangnam Style, a song which, true story, is actually a commentary about the nouveau riche young Koreans attempting to flex their material wealth and coolness like the kids in the city of Gangnam. It's basically the dance craze EDM version of Beverly Hills by Weezer. So yeah, um, <laughs> Soteji and his really? boys, uh, don't forget the boys, they succeeded from shirking conventionality, and then Psy succeeded from shirking conventionality, and, um, hmm, am I forgetting somebody? Part 2. Who are BTS, and why are they so big? Okay, so, so Teji and Boys debut. They make Korean pop rap a thing, they become hugely influential, and then Lee Soo Man, president of SM Entertainment, realizes that black music is going to be a key to constructing K-pop in the image of So Teji and others, so he scouts an attractive boy band that blends sex appeal with hip-hop and calls it H.O.T. H.O.T. succeeds and soon floods of boy groups and girl groups follow to varying degrees of success, often paired with behind-the-scenes controversies, fan wars, slave contracts, and everyone's favorite subject of Twitter arguments, cultural appropriation. Hip-hop becomes super popular in Korea as fans of the genre and culture devise new ways in which the Korean language can be bent into rap music without sounding awkward or overly imitative of Americans and the uncomfortable ideas Korean society had of black American culture, yikes. To thank for this, you have OGs like Verbal Chint and Tiger JK of Drunken Tiger, but you also have Epic High to thank, led by Korean-Canadian rapper and Stanford graduate Tableau. Fuck you if you don't think he graduated from Stanford. Epic High became successful 
not Damn. only in hip hop subcultural circles, but also in the mainstream eye. In the midst of this booming new K pop music industry, and by K pop, I do mean idol music, as well as the rise of rap music in the mainstream, a successful idol music producer named Pang Si Hyuk starts his own record label in 2005 called Big Hit Entertainment. The label struggles with money, but stays afloat by working with different groups. In 2010, one of Big Hit's producers, P Dog, and an underground rapper named Sleepy are drunk. Sleepy says to P Dog, Hey, bro, do you want to see this teenage rapper I found an audition? He's pretty dope. And P Dog says, Bro, yes. So Sleepy finds these underground Korean rap videos of this one 16 year old kid named Kim Nam Chun. P Dog is like, Bro, he's dope. And Sleepy is like, Bro, I told you. And then P Dog decides to tell Pang about Kim Nam Chun. And then Pang is like, Holy cow, he's dope. And then P Dog is like, I told you. And Pang is like, Shut up, I'm your boss. And P Dog is like, Yes, I'm sorry, Mr. Pang. And then Pang is like, Bring this kid in immediately to audition for my label. So Nam Chun comes in, he does the audition. And Pong is blown away and he signs him on the spot. Now, the problem is, Pong doesn't know what to do with this kid. He knows he's the real deal and is devoted to making him part of a bigger project to get him famous. And so he decides, I'm gonna put Nam Jun in a rap group like Epic High. So they start holding auditions for rappers and a bunch of them come and go. The second audition, which contained a video cattle call that has since become an infamous meme, brought in the group's second rapper, Min Yoongi, aka Suga. As time evolves, the idea morphs from being a rap group to being a rap-centric idol group, and uh, Suga and Namjoon realize that they have to dance, which, um, which probably sucked for them. <laughs> what you have to understand about Big Hit is that they were a small company, really small. They would never be able to compete on the level of big labels like SM and YG, who would cherry pick amazing talent, offer them the best potential rewards, and put them in a well-resourced, regimented training system. Big Hit had no trainee system in place when they brought in Namjoon and scraped by to create one, brought in more members, and adapted with what they had. There are many clips and pics online from this time period, which include the group's senior member, Chin, paying for the youngest member, Chungguk's food out of his pocket instead of from funding they had from Big Hit, which was quite low. When it was finally time for BTS to debut, their act was sharpened and had resolve. They were going to wear dark clothes and do lots of acrobatics and shouts on stage. They were going to critique Korean society based on their own feelings and influences from groups like Epic High, as encouraged by Pang and as part of Big Hit's mantra of music for healing. They were going to film themselves a lot, capturing their struggle to get better from the beginning. Their second ever reality show featured the group heading to Los Angeles to get drilled on hip hop culture, which was to be a fulcrum of their ethos. So how did this group succeed so much more than any other big group before them? Generally, I'd say it's because they blended the subversive, progressive virality of acts like Soteji and Boys and Psy with the well-trained dynamism of big groups like Big Bang and EXO. But perhaps more importantly, BTS, um, intentionally and inadvertently, had an ethos. Being a fan of BTS meant sharing in that ethos. BTS and Big Hit pushed music for healing. Each of their records have messages, implicit and explicit, which encourage social change, respect, and self-healing. Their first ever series of- That right there is why I'm here right now. Why I'm continuing to do these things, why I'm sitting through these videos and learning about these young men is because of this right here. Now, like they said, you could have gone to YG, you could have gone to SM uh, or whatever their ones were, the big guys and everything. And yeah, they're going to be able to offer you a better sign on, uh, possibly better living situations right off the bat uh, and, and better training for sure. Absolutely. But you're also going to be sacrificing a couple things too. Uh, integrity. You're going to be, you know, your artistic integrity, what you want to say, how much freedom do you have to say what you want to say? Uh, what is the main mission statement behind these companies? One thing that I, I, I've mentioned this before, so I'll be very brief here. Uh, one thing that I definitely respect about Big Hit is like their mission statement, music for healing, about their core message, about what, you know, what they believe in, what they want to do, what they want to express, what they want to leave behind uh, when they're gone. And uh, those are the, really the big questions, and those are the choices that I think really make or break people. And uh, I, I honestly, I, I really believe going with Big Hit was probably a big reason um, that where we are right now. You know, if they would have gone with YG or something like that and they would have prepackaged them uh, and made it so cookie cutter uh, and basically just given them the lyrics and not talking about any like these very important issues, I don't feel like we would have had the same group. Um, and that's why I'm so against those kind of companies. But uh, I'm a big fan of Big Hit from everything that I've heard so far. Let's uh, continue.
of albums known as the school series tackled the commodification of dreams and the pressure from older generations themes that would later surface in anti-establishment anthems like Bepsay and paradise or take the later love yourself album series as another example the self-explanatory title bridges together a conceptualized album trilogy by the group which delved into themes of self-love and exploration of identity and bear in mind that this kind of stuff the trilogies the thematic through lines that's stuff that hadn't really been done in this format at all prior to BTS and became influential. He's wearing a Nirvana shirt. These albums were not only written to appeal to young audiences, but to guide young audiences to happier, healthier lives. And in this way, BTS perfectly called to the duality we see in the history of K-pop, blending the exportable Western ideals of progressivism, expressivism, and rebellion with the Confucian ideals of respect and patience and morality. This is why older audiences as well as non-female audiences also highly approve of BTS, especially in Korea. They don't see the same facetiousness or consumer in BTS's methodology. The general quality that gets brought up is authenticity or organicness, which are at their roots very confusing and toxic words, but still feel apropos in describing the unique quality of BTS. Let's look at another article written by the aforementioned TK Park alongside author Young Day Kim. It examines the boy band label given to BTS and how BTS compare with other boy bands throughout history, saying this of their organic status. Quote, BTS's music comes across as organic because it is a natural output of the members' own minds. It is not a coincidence that BTS began their musical journey with hip-hop, the genre that perhaps has the highest bar for authenticity. Lead rapper Kim Namjoon writes his lyrics, so does Suga, who also produces, so does J-Hope, who also produces, and the rest of the group, all vocalists, all contribute to the creative process in their own ways as well. But BTS not only have a message and an independent spirit and a creative vitality, they also have a little engine that could story, a feel-good tale about this one under-resourced group that stuck to their guns and ended up succeeding past all of the other much more well-resourced, richer, more conventional groups. It's also worth noting that BTS's fan base is incredibly culturally and demographically diverse in general. It includes all genders, all sexual orientations, and all age groups. That's not to say that there aren't fans of other groups from all demographics, it just doesn't split quite as evenly as BTS's fan base does, usually. You see tweets from older married couples excitedly ruminating on seeing BTS live for the first time. These dynamics are not only unprecedented within K-pop, they are unprecedented to any boy band anywhere in the world, perhaps including the Beatles, whose pop work and more subversive work mostly engaged younger and artsier audiences, while BTS appealed to all age groups and interest groups. When you simply label BTS as a K-pop group, or as a boy band, and then paint their fan bases, sex-crazed young women whose attraction to the group stems from physical attraction and general excitement and hysteria, you not only are sort of painting a bad image about young women in general and their tastes, but you're also missing a key component of why the group is successful. So if labeling BTS as a K-pop group isn't wholly accurate, is it accurate at all? Part three, conclusion. Are BTS a K-pop group? Uh, yeah. Yeah, they're a K-pop group. At least I think so. You might notice that I am uh, doing this a bit different from the rest of the video. Um, that's because I recorded this part a few days after the original video was recorded because I wanted to redo this part and make sure that I worded it correctly, make sure that I, you know, came off the way that I wanted to come off and articulated the points that I wanted to articulate. At the end of the day, this is a pretty nuanced conversation, one that different people are going to stand on different sides of. And I don't take issue with anybody saying that BTS aren't a K-pop group because categorization is pretty dumb and up to anybody to, you know, decide. And also I think, you know, it's, it's pretty refreshing to hear that people want to take BTS and their achievements and, and, and put it in its own category. That's a beautiful thing in a way. I just think for one, when you look at what BTS have done from the fact that they came from the K-pop industry, that they accept idol as a title and they you know made it the center of one of their songs one of their hits idol and the fact that they've done you know reality shows and variety shows first doing them on the network shows and then doing them on their own the fact that they have you know similar release strategies to k-pop groups and how much output they do the way that they combine different styles of music i mean they have their own unique blend of it but it's still a blend that pretty much resembles k-pop in a lot of ways 
the fact that they sing in Korean, the fact that they, you know, are in the same category when it comes to award shows and nominations as somebody like EXO or somebody like Blackpink. You know, they just swept all the death sangs this past, you know, season. I think ultimately what BTS do is take the format and the ideas of K-pop and rearrange them and, and edit them and elevate them in many ways. They don't represent a different category altogether from K-pop to me. They represent a new horizon for it. They represent somebody pushing the boundaries of it and, and opening up the definition of K-pop and, and blazing a new trail for different artists who want to do K-pop to see what they did and learn from them. They're changing the definition a little bit and they're opening it up, but they're not necessarily separating themselves entirely from K-pop. I think ultimately what the problem is here is not necessarily whether or not you can classify BTS as K-pop, because like, sure, you can. The problem is that people are so predisposed to categorizing them as K-pop before anything else. The problem is that people want to wash over the unique elements of the things that they do in order to just classify them as a K-pop group and attribute all their success and their glory to that. That's not fair and that's not smart. It's not smart even when you do it with other groups that have pushed the boundaries of K-pop, like a Soteji or like a Seventeen who write and produce their own music, like a G-Friend who are similar, like IU who does amazing conceptual work as well. I think that these people are not necessarily separate from K-pop, but you can classify them as so many more things than K-pop. You can classify BTS ultimately as a pop group or a pop rap group or whatever yeah. before you classify them as K-pop because they belong in the same category as someone like Taylor Swift or someone like Halsey who greatly respects and admires them or Ariana Grande or Billie Eilish. I mean, these are the kind of artists that BTS find themselves in the same level of global success as. They're the type of artists that ultimately BTS are similar to in many ways and yet because they're Korean and because K-pop is a part of their identity, it pretty much dominates the conversation unfairly. We, mm. we are very easy going when it comes to classifying people regionally when they come from other regions but not recognizing that we are regional artists ourselves in the united states that's kind of poorly worded but whatever ultimately i think that's the message of idol is that they are k-pop artists and you can call them that but you can also call them many other things they're proud of that part of themselves but to define them as that would be to be missing the entirety of the picture and that's something that happens with media a lot. We categorize things very easily, try to attribute things in nice little boxes without recognizing the big picture. Especially for something as gigantic as BTS is in terms of a worldwide movement, that's a huge mistake. Once you acknowledge that the things people think about K-pop are not entirely true, you begin to see that the supposed separation between BTS and K-pop is not as drastic as one may think, while still being there to some degree. BTS mix elements of hip-hop, a black American genre, with indigenous Korean culture, like in their engendering of Han, a cultural emotional concept unique to the Korean people that involves a feeling of forlorn grief and resentment. Their music blends the Korean Confucian elements of traditional Korean society, while also also nailing elements of exploitation, of Western cultural ideas and progressivism that marked the rise of Hallyu. This does not mean that BTS's successes, as so many in global media seem to indicate, can be attributed to the rise of K-pop. The rise of BTS <laughs> and the rise of K-pop are distant cousins. BTS's rise, while related to Hallyu and K-pop's growing popularity, is its own unique story. K-pop makes sense as a categorization for BTS in terms of one of the elements of who they are, but it does not make sense as a broad to paint over BTS's story the same way one can brush over White Snake's success as being attributed to hair metal. BTS do elude categorization in a way perhaps unmatched throughout pop music history, and for that, they do live in their own category. But that doesn't make them not a K-pop group. It doesn't mean that the K-pop category can't describe them just as the hip-hop category or the general pop category can at times. Additionally, while many Koreans will tell you that K-pop is not popular amongst adults in Korea and is not treated as a serious genre, that doesn't mean it isn't a serious genre. The rise of poptimism in American music criticism, while controversial for a number of reasons, does center around the reality that pop music is still a legitimate and investigatable form of music, even at its most saturated and commoditized. This is especially true of pop artists who explore the form through writing and producing, much like Taylor Swift, yeah. Kendrick Lamar, Damn is a pop album and it slaps, don't at me, and of course BTS. 
For years before the climate crisis comes to erase civilization, we will be discussing BTS. We will be figuring out how to categorize them, failing, and then analyzing why we failed. And in the present tense, we have to continue to pressure Western media to cover BTS like the unique phenomenon that they are, not as the symptom of a viral wave or an inhumane industry or a sex-fueled craze, but as a unique, game-changing group of artists. So much of the story of BTS is one of fighting K-pop, from dealing with accusations of faking sales numbers when their album eclipsed Big Bang's album in 2015, to dealing with waves of hateful fan comments you can probably find in videos that have the term BTS and hardship in the title. This extends to fighting the label of K-pop, a label so unfairly loaded it can instantly turn global audiences away, from conservative country boys in the south of the US, to the hyper-masculinist audiences from conservative countries in Latin America, to the leftist communities appalled by the spooky K-pop industry. That, by the way, is its own thing that we gotta cover in a separate video. We forget check that often out. that neither BTS nor K-pop can be properly and unilaterally defined. They both wield complicated semiotic experiences. They not only symbolize so many things, but the things that they symbolize differ greatly from person to person. In studying BTS, we observe how a person or group of people's categorization can be theirs to champion, or theirs to destroy. How your category can both be the thing you feel you are the least and the thing you feel you are the most. I said that in such a deep and cool way. God bless me. God bless me for acting like I'm a smart person. We done. Get it off my hands. Off my hands. Thanks to everyone for helping me out. Thanks to Motobora. Hey, thanks to my cat for the amazing support. I think she left. Um, check out our other videos moving forward and uh, follow TY But Disagree on Twitter. I have been your host, Elliot Sang. If you have an opinion about this. And you All right. So this was, yeah, this is a very informative video. I actually really like this one. Uh, I was a little worried that they're going to be going over a lot of the same old facts uh, that I've heard from a couple different other videos. So I didn't want to kind of beat this thing into the ground. Uh, but it was, uh, this was good. This was a fun and very informative video. And, you know, I, I feel like I'm starting to get a broader understanding. Let me just switch screens here real quick. Let me get a better view for everybody. Um, yeah, I feel like I'm getting a, a much better understanding just in general of, you know, what, I guess idol groups. Yeah, I guess idol groups is, is one of my main takeaways from there. I guess they don't really, pref you know, uh, refer to them as K-pop artists or, or things like that. It's it's actually uh, idol groups, which which makes sense, you know, uh, for over there. And I've heard the, the term idol groups being tossed around uh quite a bit as well but i uh, this was uh this was interesting um i liked learning about some of like the earlier k-pop uh artists um i liked learning that they, a lot of them even played their own instruments and did things like that uh it was it was kind of cool but i feel like i have a lot more information that i need to just basically absorb and learn about uh from just south korean culture uh music culture and things like that it just seems very fascinating to me uh so i'm gonna either do it in my own time or do reaction videos to just i guess korea <laughs> in general because i'm also very fascinated with that um but um yeah and another cool takeaway that i had too is like it, it seems like bts is really just touching people uh and people from all sorts of different backgrounds uh young old whatever ethnicity i mean it seems like bts has impacted their lives uh in whatever way and when i first started my journey here with bts like i said i just thought that this was kind of what this guy was saying you know us westerners we just think of bts as music for thirsty young girls you know uh but that's just not the case uh that's it's 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 very much not the case uh the fan base is all over the place and uh it, it's intriguing for me to do this and, and to be learning in this way because it's building so much hype around the actual music uh, learning about, you know, just kind of like their mission statements, who they are as people, what they're trying to do, uh, especially hearing some of these album titles uh, and hearing how well that they're doing. It really just makes you want to sit down with a good, good pair of headphones and just put, play the whole thing. And honestly, quite frankly, if you're curious about how I'm going to start reacting to the BTS music, that's probably how I'm going to do it. I'm going to put the first album in and we're just going to play the whole thing. I'm going to do a reaction to the entire album from start to finish. It'll probably be like a three hour stream, uh, just dissecting each song and going through it song by song uh, so if you want to be a part of that make sure to like and subscribe because that will be coming up inevitably when i'm a bts expert <laughs> how long that will take i have no idea but i'm trying guys but yeah i enjoyed this this video uh, a lot uh i'm not sure what i do for the next video or what documentary i should do next i know that there's this series online that a ton of people have been asking me to go through and trust me i am so stick around for that there's this website or this youtube page that has um 
uh, these like episodes. There's like 12 of them already. I'm going to start doing that possibly next week. Uh, and I'm just going to go through the whole series. I'm going to be looking for more document documentaries uh, and any other information. So if you have any information about BTS that you'd like to share with me, anything you'd like me to react to, uh, post it down in the comments or even better, jump in the Discord. Uh, like I said, the link is down below. Uh, best way to get in contact with me and figure out what's going on with the channel. But uh, guys, that's going to do it for me tonight. I hope you enjoyed yourselves and I'll catch you out on the next video. Bye-bye.